Anthony Hopkins, who's in this film. Mm -hmm. uh, Hopkins is a ham. He loves oh, yeah. this crap. Yeah. He, you know, you know, he enjoys being paid to sit on a couch and say, that's the watch that killed Hitler. Um, <laughs> yeah, while holding he, he a He does seem to be having a good time with this one. Uh, he has a sidekick uh, named Cogman, a butler transformer who doesn't transform into anything. He's more like an old timey automaton. Also he's just, a sociopath? Yeah, was, yeah he's like <laughs> a, yeah, he's, a, he's crazy and he's a martial arts butler. Um, you know, he beats up people randomly and then he serves them dinner and <laughs> He's sort of, this film's nod to self-awareness. I mean, all of them have these kind of self-aware jokes at their own expense as to how they're just repeating the same things. The, the last one did where um, uh, Mark Wahlberg's ostensible protagonist in this film, Kate Yeager, is introduced in the, in the previous film working out of an abandoned movie theater, which mm -hmm. sets up lots of sort of jokes. Sure. Um, but uh, here... You know, you have this character, this Cogman, who will play, like, actually play music in the background during exposition. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, basically... Really bombastic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Basically emphasize how ridiculous all of this is. And that sounds like a fun idea, but boy, does he never really work. No, I mean, that's the problem. I mean, it, the more we describe all the crazy shit that happens in this movie, and there's a lot of crazy shit with uh, jumping around in time and explaining the way the Transformers have, have interacted with historical events the more we make it sound like it's more fun than it is, honestly, because... They um, steal a submarine. Yes. Much like in the last Fast and Furious film. <laughs> yeah, they go to space as well, mm -hmm. sort of, right? Kind of. They go yeah. to, they go into free fall through space, mm -hmm. which, uh, you know, obviously the action in base films tend to be, tends to be weightless, and here you get it, literally, literally weightless. weightless. He can do whatever he yeah. wants in this climax. Um, but he just can't, yeah, he, he can't introduce introduce a big moment. He has his Roland Emmerich section of the film yep. where the world is being destroyed and you're constantly cutting to different people and like minor characters. Tony Hale in a very Roland Emmerich yes. supporting role, yeah. staring at a screen and talking about yeah. physics. Um, so it does, it does sort of feel like his pastiche of a... Uh, I feel like this and the last film the, it really sort of emphasizes the sense that he is just not that interested in these robots, and mm -hmm. it's mostly an excuse to make other films. Well, they're highly unappealing characters, yeah. I find, in general. I mean, of the ones I've seen. So I didn't see the fourth one, but I did see the first three, and I saw this one. And uh, I think they're 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 unappealing as characters. I mean, it, it generally is either the sort of stoic badassery of Optimus or these sort of uh, awful comic relief, like, jabbering, bantering things, you know? Yeah, they Some, do jabber an awful lot. They do. <laughs> and sometimes sometimes they're also, like, kind of gross racial caricatures as well. Um, and visually, I think they're really unappealing. I mean, that makes a certain degree of sense because Bay has really conceived these things as, like, these are big masses of gears that can come mm -hmm. in and out. Um, but you look at them, and sometimes it's hard to even tell exactly what you're looking at. Yeah. You know? They're just these really unappealing, to stare at, and so much of the movie is this them is, up this there. This is this is what the whole movie looks like behind us. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, that's it. It's just all greebles. There's like no no real main shape. It's all those little details that you yeah. would get on the surface of the Death Star or yeah. something, um, with nothing, with no shape to organize. Around. Yeah, yeah, no organizing principle exactly. Yeah. It's just these these this this just this mess of stuff, you know. Um, and uh, they don't even look that cool. Anyway, um, and for a filmmaker who is so intent on, on creating these massive ensembles of characters, I mean, li like a lot of Bay movies, this is a movie that is constantly jumping all around the world, introducing new characters. He's not very good at it. No. You know? <laughs> no. Like, he doesn't have, um, he doesn't get the rhythms of that very well. I mean, we're introduced to the love interest who is uh, this British librarian, Essentially, another touch that's very. She's a professor. She's an Oxford professor. She's I a know librarian too, isn't she? She no, she's an Oxford professor. Okay, but she does. Uh, you know, she fits that standard Bay mold of yeah. um, uh, female scientist, which is yes. pen a pencil skirt. And glasses that she doesn't wear half the time. <laughs> she takes off to be sexier, I guess. Yeah, I mean, it's um, a. She lo I understand the mistake because she looks like she belongs in like a library themed Playboy photo yeah. shoot. Um, I mean, she could be played by Megan Fox. I mean, she has sent. I, I mean, the role is almost tailored for Megan, Megan but Fox. But that's true of so many roles in these films, yeah. you know, and it's become. 
accepted wisdom that the Bay Transformers films really are totally indifferent to their human characters. Yes. But they're also, I think, totally indifferent to the robots as well. 